All right, we can go ahead and get started now. I'd like to thank everyone for taking the time to register for today's webinar. My name is Chris Cooper, and I work for Cinemassive, a company headquartered in Atlanta, and we've been designing and deploying advanced video wall solutions for command and control rooms since 2005. Before we get started, please note that anytime you can submit any questions you have in the chat box in the lower right, and we'll cover all of them at the end of our presentation in a question and answer segment. In addition, we'll be sending a link to the recording of this webinar to everyone who registered. So with that, I would like to turn the webinar over to Tom Polivka, our Vice President of Sales, who will kick us off. Thanks, Chris. And thanks again to all of you for taking the time to hear about how we evolved a peerless purpose-built technology that provides field level command and control and supports the trend towards smaller, self-contained mobile units. After I provide a short introduction here, we'll finish with a demonstration by Dustin Bilthouse, so you can directly witness some of the concepts I discuss. So let's start by offering a quick overview of our qualifications for those of you who are not familiar with Cinemassive. First of all, we've designed and deployed over 800 systems worldwide. Some of these are single room projects, but many efforts entail repeat deployments for global enterprises. Along the way, we've created the broadest array of command center environments from security and network operation centers to control rooms that monitor everything from utilities, traffic, crime, and emergency operations. For our clients in the DOD and intelligence areas, we've designed and built every variety of stationary control environment from tactical and joint operation centers to arena-sized watch floors with hundreds of panels. Learning about how operators act and react in the command center environment has informed our product lifecycle and given rise to innovations, such as the ones we'll be discussing here. Having tailored a solution that could supply real-time situational awareness to global operation centers, it was inevitable that Cinemassive would begin receiving requests from commanders of warfighting units to provide the same capabilities to expeditionary forces. At this stage, some of you might wonder why common conference room solutions designed for collaboration in VTC might not fit the bill for downrange missions. Hopefully, I can answer that question by revisiting the requirements presented to us by various commanders in the field. Incidentally, what we're talking about is not the culmination of a one-time data gathering process. It's a single significant step in Cinemassive's goal to adapt to your continuously changing requirements for portability, durability, and flexibility on the battlefield. It won't surprise you to know that portability and durability are table stakes for field level command and control. After all, the best technical solution in the world is useless if it doesn't travel well or operate reliably in the field. DOD created mil specs like A10 for a reason. Harsh climate conditions are a given. Ruggedized solutions designed for downrange use are expected to operate in a very wide temperature range. Portability and deployment are also huge factors. From the beginning, our clients requested a processor that could be easily transported in a standard military pack and set up in under 15 minutes. As a final precaution, spare hard drives and battery backups are essential for operational continuity. Unlike in garrison facilities, engineering and technical competency can be hard to secure downrange. In testing solutions for required ease of use and flexibility in the field, we ask questions like, can a non-technical operator create a new layout in minutes? Can all of the layout and behavior changes be accomplished without programming? Are all of your devices controllable directly from the same place? And finally, can a novice user learn to operate the command center in under an hour? If these requirements sound stringent, I'm confident that Dustin will impress you with how our simplified Cinenet user interface supports your downrange mission. So at this stage, you might be asking how much performance you have to sacrifice with such a small form factor. If processing and throughput is minimal, then why bother to lug equipment around, since every extra pound counts in the field? As we built the requirements list for a small ruggedized processor, our DOD expeditionary consultant set a high bar. The need to process at least 16 hardwired or IP inputs and outputs was a given, even in hotter climates where processors tend to lose firepower. Like all of our systems, virtually all digital formats must be consumable and displayable to ruggedized panels or projectors. As a segue to our last slide, a portable command center must support connectivity to networks and VTCs to accommodate what we call the global common operational picture. 
When we look at early attempts by other vendors at supporting the downrange mission, field level command centers were treated as autonomous facilities pulling content in one direction. Having supported networks of command centers for some of the largest worldwide enterprises, Cinemassive adopted GCOP, or Global Common Operating Picture, as our mantra. The ability to stream composite walls to multiple sites and to access command center facilities remotely became standard for all of our systems. As we spoke to more and more expeditionary experts, we realized that we had to extend the same capabilities to our portable offerings. To maintain proper command and control at the field level, sharing among elements becomes critical. Now I'm excited to transition to Dustin Bildhouse, a Cinemassive veteran, who will demonstrate our portable, ruggedized solution that we call Strike. Awesome. Thanks for the introduction, Tom. So now that we have a brief understanding of how we can take a strike, set it up in a matter of minutes, I wanna compare that footprint and what makes it unique when we start thinking about permanent talk jock operation centers and compressing that down into a mobile footprint. So let's start with what we know about basic control room structure for a permanent talk jock type operation center. Um, we know there's gonna be a video wall, so there's gonna be that single point of focus uh, you know, that large bank of displays that all your analysts and operators are oriented towards when you walk into a room. And generally, that's going to be comprised of, you know, LCD or a seamless LED technology. And that's going to allow all your content for your common operating picture to be generated. There would be an Alpha FX processor. Um, so this is your rack mounted component. So think about, you know, all your inputs, outputs, VTCs, everything that would need to be visually digested would come through this processor and then is going to go out to the video wall or video walls or any auxiliary displays that are connected to the system. And then there's Cinenet. So Cinenet is that user interface portion of the solution. Uh, so when I think about control rooms, I like to typically think about, you know, these three components the video wall, the display, the alpha FX, the processor, and then Cinenet, which is the user interface. And that is what uh, operators are going to use to sort of generate that OODA loop type decision making process. So they're going to be observing content on the video wall. They're going to use Cinenet to orient that content up on the video wall. They're going to decide they're going to act based on that information. And then Cinenet is going to allow them to replace uh, you know, as information becomes outdated with newer updated information and actionable intelligence. Um, so that's kind of the life cycle of a basic control room. Now, if we want to take that basic control room structure and mobilize it and put it out on the field, we run into a couple of problems pretty quickly. Um, so first and foremost, just the screens themselves. Um, you know, if I have a large video wall or a small video wall, Either way, I run into the problem that these are very sensitive pieces of equipment. Um, so, you know, very narrow edge bezel panels that could be easily damaged if they're not, you know, taken down and set back up by a trained technician. Um, and additionally, if I move that video out into the field, maybe I'm taking it off a wall where I had a permanent structure to attach it to. Now I've got to include some sort of freestanding metal structure uh, so I could put that up in, let's say, a tent, right? Additionally, I have the processor component. So outside of just the Alpha FX processor, um, I've also got all my VTCs, um, you know, any servers, audio systems, um, audio DSPs that are going to be attached to that, any sort of uh, you know, power backup, UPS backup. So it's not just the processor itself, but it's all those rack components that are tied together. And once again, we're talking about a very sensitive piece of equipment. Um, and generally, you know, rack mounted components aren't always designed to be uh, ruggedized, A, and B, mobilized, you know, whether that's just being put on a uh, carrier plane or a truck um, and going from, you know, CONUS to OCONUS. So Cinenet, the user interface side of it, the software side is actually uh, extremely, extremely mobile. Uh, since this user interface is designed to basically run on virtually any device, whether it's a tablet, or a, you know, a Surface Pro or someone's laptop, um, that's easily movable. And there's no installation required for this. Uh, so even more so, it's ready for the field already. So at Cinemassive, we said, okay, great. How do we take this basic structure and mobilize it? Um, so we talked to, you know, groups within DOD, folks like JSOC and said, 
what what are the key factors that we need to achieve in order to make a mobilized solution that's going to work for everybody? Uh, one of the key components was mission ready form factor. So it's got to be small enough, essentially a jock in a box um, that one person could pick up by hand. So it doesn't require a crew to move it or a forklift, something that has to be palletized. Um, so literally like the most condensed form factor possible. Um, and that's going to lead to rapid deployment. So now if I have one person that can easily mobilize this command center, um, you know, if they can carry it by hand, throw it in the back of a Humvee or an SUV. Uh, additionally, we designed this so it could be stored in an overhead luggage compartment on an airplane. Um, and then that also leads to, you know, decreased maintenance factor as well. So that was um, another key component is the fact that virtually, since this is going to be moved around from theater to theater, um, and it could be potentially set up by virtually anybody, even a non-technical user, um, had to have decreased maintenance. It hadn't, couldn't have any sort of um, special training attached to it or any sort of special maintenance program where, you know, once this thing comes back from overseas, every time it's got to be serviced and updated. So let's start on the strike on the mobile command side where we left off with the permanent jock top type operation. Um, and start with Cinenet. So Cinenet, as I discussed, is where all that decision making is happening. Um, because this is a drag and drop interface, and we're going to show this in a few minutes, how this would actively work in the field in real time, um, there's very decreased training time. Um, so now you don't have to have people with very special knowledge and, okay, so someone moves from you know one team to another team, or you have to train an entire team to just deploy this one system. Virtually anybody that knows how to use an iPhone or an Android phone can use the Cinenet user interface. And like I said, we're going to show that very soon. Um, so that tra training time decrease is very valuable to units. Um, and then flexible content management. So it's not a static system. Uh, you can rearrange content and how the system acts based on your mission and your operation. And certainly um, you could retool that after a mission during a debrief. Uh, so the next time you go into that scenario, you're totally prepared. So on the display side, as we mentioned before, um, you know, the video wall component, um, you know, there are ways to mobilize that and ruggedize that uh, to some degree, but certainly not on the degree that one person could move it around and it's totally man portable. Um, so by going to a completely portable display system, um, that could support any display technology, whether, you know, the client has uh, Pico projectors or small form factor LCDs, or they just have existing displays. You know, maybe you're setting up in a war room or a conference room at a different base you've never been to before, and you just need to take over that space as a sort of a temporary jock. Um, whether they have 55-inch Samsungs or 70-inch Vizios that are 4K or HD, uh, the system's designed to allow you to plug into those displays and use that for the common operating picture. Um, so this does a number of things. One, it's going to decrease the amount of weight it takes to uh, move that equipment around. So we know video walls would have a very large footprint to move around. Um, so by eliminating the display factor to some degree, we've now mobilized this even further. Um, once again, very non-technical setup. Um, so video wall panels and LED panels um, require a level of technical aptitude to align, service, connect. Uh, it's not like connecting your traditional TV that you would find, you know, uh, in your living room. And then easily replaceable. So, you know, video wall panels, LED panels, um, you know, very high grade displays. Um, are not easily replaceable or serviceable out in the field. And additionally, you would have to have a spare parts kit to some degree for those to be serviced out in the field. Whereas if you had, let's just say, you know, two 30 inch off the shelf monitors, um, that's very easy to have a third one as a backup. Uh, so economically, it makes sense. Um, and then from a form factor perspective, it's also going to make sense as well. Um, so, you know, obviously it's a lot easier and more cost effective to just have a, you know, maybe a two or $300 display that, hey, you know what, someone dropped it and it broke, let's throw it out, we've got a backup here, or you know, acquire some sort of additional backup or whatever displays you have on hand, um, versus if you had a, you know, let's say a, a four by two of 24 uh, seven rating command and control grade LCD monitors making up a video wall, 
um, that's not something that you can just uh, forgive and forget. And now certainly last but not least is the processing end of this solution. So now you know we've created that full circle, that life cycle of what we had in the permanent talk jock and mobilized it. So we've got the user interface for decision making, we've got the common operating picture and a portable display package, and then we have the strike FX. So this is the processor. So once again, you know, we were looking at the permanent jock talk type operation. This is where all our inputs and outputs were coming into. We've taken that processor, we've ruggedized it, um, we've made it mill grade. Um, it's designed to be temperature resistant and totally dust proof. There's no moving parts there. Um, and then it's bringing all the control capabilities that you would have in the permanent jock talk operation center out into the field. Um, so once again, that's reducing that training time because if I was training on you know system A that is CONUS and then now I move to tactical operations out in the field, I'm using the same user interface. So the training is uh, ubiquitous across both systems. And that's how we kind of get that cohesive uh, life cycle, cycle going for a mobile command center. So now let's kind of dive into um, how that footprint flows and then how we can kind of tie these systems together out in the field. So this is just kind of a high level line drawing of what uh, the strike would look like out in the field. Uh, so obviously towards the center here I have my FX strike processor. This is the fully ruggedized mobilized version of a larger processor that you would find in a permanent home. I've got my Synonet user interface for driving that content to these displays. This is, this is where I'm doing that orient to side act action. Um, and then I have my field content sources. So maybe I have a VTC codec, maybe I've got a couple SIPR laptops that I'm connecting in the system. Um, these are physically being fed into the FX strike, and then I would be connecting these to field displays. Um, so I've got four displays here, uh, which could be in any sort of um, anywhere within my tent or my field operation in any configuration. This just happens to kind of be reflective of that sort of two by two. Uh, but I could run this off one display, and I could run this off two displays, three, all the way up to four. Um, so there's not a specific requirement that you always have to drive four displays. And once we jump into the user interface side, you could see how you could drive this at just on 50% of the output capacity of the strike and just drive this across two displays. So one of the things that we learned in developing this product and talking to DOD command is, um, you know, the FX strike within itself, the single kit is awesome. It's great. It's absolutely what we need out in the field. Uh, but what happens when we expand beyond the capacity of the displays or the inputs on a single strike. So what you could actually do is tie two strikes together to work off a single Synonet user interface. Um, so maybe I've got a strike on the left side of my tent and a strike on the right side of my tent, um, both being used by the same unit. Um, and this just allows me to immediately increase the amount of inputs I need or outputs I need. Um, so maybe, you know, I've got a zipper codec over here and I need a nipper codec over there. Um, additionally, I've got, you know, an increase of workstations or laptops. Um, now these could be totally separated and work autonomously. Um, so maybe if that single unit need to break up and use these kits in different theaters, awesome, not a problem. Um, but then they could easily attach them together to work in a sort of a larger capacity for a larger operation. Um, and then you don't have to worry about increasing your footprint as well and start delving back into video wall territory, right? So that's one of the things we want to do is not provide a product that was going to be immediately limited and say, okay, how can we allow, allow this product to expand over time with the needs of unit? So with that being said, uh, we're going to jump into sort of a demo portion. So I want to show a live working demonstration of how you would manage content on a strike. All right, so let's dive into some workflows on the strike processor itself. Um, so those of the view that are not familiar with Synonet, this is the user interface portion of the solution. Um, so you know, we've talked about the displays, we talked about the processor, and now we're going to dive into specifically the user interface. Um, so now just I'm running this with the keyboard and mouse off my laptop, but out in the field you might run this off a ruggedized tablet of some sort uh, provided by Cinemassive in the strike kit. I'm going to use my username and password 
Um, you could have as many logins as you needed on the system. Typically, you'd probably have one or two logins, maybe an admin login, and then a uh, standard operator login. And once I'm logging into the system, I'm immediately greeted with two modes. Um, and these modes could be based on operation. Um, I've set these up in advance. Um, the unit or the client end user of the strike could set these up. Um, and essentially what I've broken it up into is field operations. Um, so this is when I'm using it for an actual mission or an event. And then I have a CONUS training mission. So this is when I'm uh, back at base and I just need to do some general training stuff on the strike. So what we're, we're going to do is dive into field operations. So I'll click on field operations. Um, and then I'm immediately going to be greeted with a live representation of my video wall. Um, so for the purposes of our conversation, you know, we've talked about varying display setups. Um, like I said, we could uh, support up to four 4K video outputs from the strike. Um, in this instance, I just have two displays hooked up. So I've got a 4K display one on the left and 4K display two on the right. Um, now, if I click up here on the top right, I've set up a couple different configurations. Um, and this is going to be indicative of how you might set up your operation. So maybe these two displays right here are my common operating picture, uh, but maybe I need to manage a video conference codec separately that I'm outputting content to, um, or I've got a third display or fourth display even uh, within the field that is more, um, less of the common operating picture and more of a static route type thing. Um, so I'll click on quad display. And so this is what my quad display setup might look like. Now, this may or may not reflect how it is actually set up out in the field, um, but this is just how I want to manage it within the user interface is I want to know display one, display two, display three, and display four. Um, they might be linear, linearly next to each other, left to right in the real world, or they might be two in the front and two behind me, or they could all be in separate spaces um, and not any sort of very specific configuration. And what this really allows me to do is just sort of track that. Um, so if I had four displays, I could run it in a quad view like this, or I could run it one, two, three, four, left to right across like a book. Um, and then I'm gonna click on video conference codec, and this is what would be indicative of managing just a single display output. So as you see, this would just be a single HD video output um, if I was just managing one display out in the field, um, but also if I was just sending content out to a VTC um, to send that far side, that's kind of what this would look like. So for the purposes of this demo, um, I'm just gonna go switch back to dual display mode. So I'm in dual display mode now. Um, so you notice this white line right here, this sort of represents the break in the physical monitors in the real world. Um, now across the bottom of the screen is all my content that's coming in the strike, whether those are physical inputs or uh, content that I've added to the system like a clock so that would live natively on the processor itself. Um, and additionally, if I was decoding IP streams from across uh, various sources, those would live down here as well. Um, so the amount of sources I hear, have down here are more indicative of just example purposes. Um, so out in the field, it might actually end up being a little bit lighter. Now, if I want to take any one of these sources and put it on display one, I would just grab this, say, okay, boop, drag that up there. Um, and then maybe I want to take this uh, helmet camera video and put it on display two. So I've immediately put content up on uh, my displays and I could just drag and drop this around as needed. And what's really powerful about the strike is, let's say I'm out in the field and I only have these two displays to work with. Um, and I can't just keep, keep moving content around like this and swapping things in and out. Oh, hey, I need this clock. Oh, hey, I need to go back to this uh, news feed or whatever. Um, oh, hey, I need this laptop over here now. So I'm pushing content up, I'm taking content down. Um, that's not very conducive to my operation. So let's go ahead and clear the wall here. And what we can do with grid snapping is now I'm going to take that single display and break it up into a quad view. So now I need to take this and this and this clock up here and I need this over on the left. Maybe I need that blown up. And then you could actually change this during an operation and say, hey, you know what, actually I don't need that blown up anymore. 
let's just go ahead and move that over there. And now I need to bring in this new piece of content uh, for this VTC call. So very flexible, you see very quickly how we were able to rearrange and adjust the common operating picture based on the needs of the event. Now I'll go ahead and clear my wall here. So we've been dragging and dropping some content up here sort of ad hocly. Um, and this is great for setup purposes um, during a mission or pre-mission. What you can actually do with grid snapping is very powerful. Um, so I could break up any HD output up to 125th of a screen. So if I want to get very specific with where I'm placing my clocks and things like that, um, I could easily do so. And then start filling in that single monitor however I need to for my briefing. So I'm not limited to just that quad view or that single output view. Um, I can get very dynamic very quickly with my content. Uh, now, generally, you would build that out over time for your operation in advance. And what I'm going to do is tab over down here to layouts. Now, these are pre-configured layouts that I've built over time that I know I need to support my mission. Um, so I've just named these generically. You can name them whatever you need to for your operation. You would simply just click rename. And I just want to recall this layout. Awesome. Boom. There's all the content I need. It's organized exactly how I need to. Oh, you know what? I need to switch to this mode and adjust for that VTC call to see some different information. Awesome. Boom. Done. Or I need to switch to this mission view. So very quickly, I'm allowed to rearrange my content um, by knowing in advance kind of what my needs for the operation are versus having to ad hocly drag and drop. And this is where we kind of circle back around to that reduced, reduced time for training on a system like this. So anybody could very easily walk up and you know just click on one of these with their finger or a mouse and just recall that visual information. And then if you start naming it very specifically, um, so you could call that out and say, hey, guy on the other side of the tent, click on VTC call two or mission view, they immediately just walk up to the screen, know exactly what to do. That doesn't take any specific training. So let's go ahead and clear our wall here. And so how do we get from point A to point B in terms of building those layouts is very, very easy. Uh, so I'm just gonna put this in a two by two mode. We'll just drag some content up here real quickly. Boom, boom, boom. And maybe I want this content over here. Boom, boom. Once I have that arranged how I need to for my operation, I would hit save. I would name this whatever we need to. So we'll just call this strike. I would save it. I'm gonna get confirmation that's, that's been saved. And now if I tab back over to my layouts, I've got my strike layout. So very quickly during a mission, I've created a view. I like that view, I saved it, and now I have it recallable for later during that mission. Or even if I pack up and go to a different theater, I know, hey, I created this view. It was very helpful during that event. Let's keep that in our system. Or maybe not, you know what? We used it one time, we didn't like it. Let's delete it out of the system. Are you sure you want that to go away? Yes, we never want to use that again. And then I just clear my wall. So very flexible to support varying missions out in the field um, with quick advancements in the common operating picture. One of the things you'll notice as I'm pulling up various pieces of content, so if I pull this clock up, pretty cool. Um, if I pull up this uh, laptop here, I've got this yellow border, I've labeled it, and I can also pull up the original, let's just pull up this content right here, um, which has no border and no label. Um, so I can pull in the raw feed totally unaltered, um, but let's say I want to somehow classify or give a little bit of description to this content. Because uh, otherwise, if I'm pulling those up as an operator, maybe down here I know what I'm pulling up. I'm pulling up, you know, Sipper Helmet Cam 1. Okay, great. But once it's up on the wall, how do I know specifically what I'm looking at? Um, now, as an operator, I can click here on asset names to show what this name is. Um, so through the UI, as the operator, I know what I'm looking at, but this wouldn't actually show up on the video wall itself. Uh, so we need a way to translate that information to what's happening on the common operating picture on the screen itself. Um, and what we'll do for that is, I'll just go ahead and remove this. We'll bring this content up here. 
what I'm going to do is right click it. I'm going to click create composite asset from. And I could name this. So we'll call this uh, strike webinar. And I'll just add a border to it. Maybe I'll just add a small uh, red border. Um, and that way I can associate it to a specific classification or something that means um, has significance to my operation. Uh, I'll add text to it. Um, I can change the size of that text. And maybe I want the color of it to match my border. And we'll just call this strike example. And I want it over here on the far right side of my screen. And then I would save it. And now I have this new strike web composite asset. So it's the same source, but what I've done here is I've just labeled it and added a border. But what I've done here is I've just labeled it and added a border. Um, so that would actually show up on the display. So this is what I would see on the common operating picture um, on that field display in my tent. So that way, you know, this feed, anyone else in the room might not know what it is. As an operator, I can know what it is. But what this does with the composite asset feature is now I've added a label to it and I've gave it a little bit of classification. So for other folks in the room, they now have some context for what they're seeing. And that just really helps uh, translate uh, the needs of the mission. Let me go ahead and clear my wall here. So we've shown how we can control multiple displays on the system. So we'll just keep using this uh, two by one setup as an example. And let's say I've got a VTC codec attached to this system. Um, obviously I could take content from that codec, codec and use it as an input on my system. But additionally, if that codec has a video input, I could send content from my strike uh, to far side users. So I'll just click on my video conference codec. Um, on this system specifically, it's just an HD video output. And let's just manage this as uh, maybe I just want to send one piece of content there. So now I've switched to the codec view and I just want to take this laptop and send that up there and switch that. Um, and I'd be operating in a very ad hoc mode. Now what I could do to sort of speed that process up is I would have, I've already pre-built layouts. Instead of dragging and dropping, I just click on my layout. So I need to send this Zipper 2 laptop or I need to send this laptop over here and I can just quickly recall that without having to drag and drop that. Um, and additionally, I have a layout that has all four of my sources and I would be pushing this view to the far side user. This is what they would see, you know, with the color borders and the labeling on there. Now I'll go ahead and clear my wall. What I've done to speed up this process is on my behaviors menu, um, and now this as a trained operator, um, this is something that I would create in the system, is I can create specific functions um, or macros depending on what I need the system to do. So what I've done is with those layouts that I've created, I've sort of created automated buttons here on this menu. So now I don't even have to click on the layouts, I just click on this fly out behaviors menu and quickly recall that all VTC content. Now this has a couple immediate benefits. So notice I had to switch to my video conference codec view to start making these changes before. I'll go back to my dual display strike view. And you notice this menu here is still there. I still have this information available to me. So now I can switch the content I'm sending to far side users through my VTC without actually having to go here, drop down video conference codec and switch that display. I'm able to do it on the fly over here very easily. And then that still allows me to manage my mission view over here on my main displays. So I'm actually managing multiple outputs from the same view without having to switch back and forth because I know generally, oh, okay, I wanna send all this content or this specific content. Um, and as the admin or as a trained operator, I'm making these decisions for my users. Now I'll go ahead and clear my wall here. So one of the things I really want to circle back around it on is how we've taken a lot of the mission critical capabilities in a permanent Jocker talk and ported that over into a portable system because we're using the same interface that you would see in a permanent installation. Um, so if I just pull up my mission view real quick, if 
I'm in the room with my operators and I need to annotate on content, start translating you know, mission information, I can easily do, do so in room, same way I would any permanent type solution. Um, as well, if I, as I need to control my VTC system, I could do that through Cinenet and control my VTC camera as well um, to adjust that in the space, dial out, make calls. Like I said, you have you know, your own behaviors menu that you can create um, that is very specific to your team and your event as well as we support um, kiosk mode. So, you know, the drag and drop interface is really awesome, really great. Um, I just set this up in an example, you know, maybe you're training back stateside. Um, and it, what I've created is this quick select mode. And this just takes everything I've done in my field operations mode and it's just made it easier. I could actually use this for a mission if I wanted to, but this is allowing me to just recall very specific um, layouts on that system that I've created. So if that's all I needed to do during my event, I could just run the control screen in kiosk mode and that way any user totally untrained could walk up here and just say, oh, hey, we need this jock view or hey, we need this mission view and click on those and make those changes. Um, and then additionally, I could base that on various uh, behaviors or automations I want in the system as well. I've just done it based on layouts. So we've talked now about how we've taken a permanent operations center and made it portable, ruggedized, so it could go out into the field. We've talked about how strikes can be modularly um, attached to each other and work together in tandem. And we've shown how this field operation would work in an enclosed environment. Now let's talk about the global common operating picture. So we're familiar with this workflow down here with our field display or displays and our field content sources. Um, but this might be a more typical jock that I need to communicate information back to, receive information from, that has a larger permanent FX Elite or core mounted in a rack somewhere. They've got a permanent video wall with dedicated 24-7 panels for the common operating picture, and they have their own content sources. Uh, because we're using a ubiquitous system, we'd be able to communicate back and forth. So I'd be able to push information, whether it's these drone feeds or these laptops, out to my strike and share information, annotate on their displays and communicate information back to them. And vice versa, if the folks out in the field in that field operation need to communicate information back to me, they could do so as well. So now these, uh, this permanent solution and this field solution can start working together. Um, and then you could also have multiple strikes out in the field, all communicating back to the jock working together. Um, so that's a really, really powerful solution. We start talking about the global common operating picture. Um, I think now uh, this is probably a pretty good stopping point. We've covered a lot of territory in a short amount of time. And I believe we wanna open this up to a little bit of Q&A and see some of your questions and thoughts on this. Great, thanks Dustin. That was a wonderful overview of the strike systems and our Cinenet platform. If anyone is interested in seeing an interactive demo specifically for your organization, please email us at sales at cinemassive.com and we'll be happy to schedule some time with you. Again, that's sales at cinemassive.com. Now we'll go ahead and move on to the question and answer portion. Please feel free to submit any questions you have in the lower right hand corner. If you click on the question mark there, it'll automatically flag it as a question. And we'll go ahead and address them as they come in here. Let's see, first up, let me run through here. Get a few of these set up momentarily, folks. Got a couple things coming in. Uh, great, our first question up here. Can you outline the specifics off offerings for the strike? Does the strike come in any packages or kits? Actually, Dustin, as you get to this, I've got a image yep. I can go ahead and show here. One second, there it is. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks, Chris. Um, yeah. So there are a couple packages um, for the strike. That's kind of how we built the solution is around uh, essentially what are kits. Um, so in the upper top left is the uh, strike that we were showing in most of the videos and what we were reviewing. So that's the fully ruggedized version. Um, in the bottom right is the strike SR. So it's a semi ruggedized portable version um, with the same features and capabilities. We also have different cases for the Strike SR and the fully ruggedized Strike. Um, so you can get just the processor itself, and then we actually have a kit that would include um, the control screen, cables, the actual case for that. Um, and then we also, in terms of display options, even though we engineered the Strike to be able to connect to virtually any display, 
um, that you would have available to you. Um, we have a quad uh, fully ruggedized display kit. So in the upper right-hand corner, um, that sort of two by two view, those are 22 inch fully ruggedized monitors that include a case itself uh, if you need to transport it. And then in the bottom left, left is a much larger display. Uh, so that's actually a 70 inch pop-up kit. Um, so you could, you know, uh, send that to wherever you need to, roll it into a room or a tent. Um, and then that 70 inch display pops up out of that case. Um, and then you just connect it to your strike kit. Okay, great. Let's head back to the question and answer page here. Uh, let's see, up next, can Strike connect to a projector? Uh, yeah, no, absolutely. This is Dustin again. So, um, you know, projectors, TVs, displays, um, essentially anything that has a HDMI input going into it, uh, we could easily connect this Strike to. So if you had uh, a combination of projectors and displays, whether it was LCD or LED, uh, you can connect those in tandem at the same time, or you could just do nothing but projectors. Um, and I, the nice thing about that is, you know, you could set up the projectors however you need to, depending on your walls and screens that you have available. Great. Next question up here. What are some of the common field displays being used, and how are they packaging them? Uh, yeah, I think that's uh, pretty similar to the first question. So... Um, in terms of displays that Cinemassive provides in kits, we have that quad uh, fully ruggedized setup with the 22-inch monitors, and then we have a 70-inch pop-up display. Um, outside of that, it's, you know, it's sort of um, up to the end user to decide what display and what configuration they want. Okay, terrific. And one other question that kind of goes along with this here. Uh, does Cinemassive have a dedicated display available that complements the strike? Uh, yes. So uh, I think we're, we're answering the same question once more. But uh, yes, we do have a, a two sets of dedicated displays um, that complements the strike. But there's, um, there's nothing that would necessarily uh, require you or tie you to using that s display specifically from Cinemassive with the strike processor. All right. And next up, what are the environmental limitations for the strike? Um, but, uh, we actually have uh, Jared Blair on the line as well. Jared, do you want to take that question? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the operating temperatures um, of the strike uh, is up to 105 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and probably less common, uh, you can go as low as negative 13 uh, degrees Fahrenheit uh, as well. Um, and you can operate it up in uh, to 95% humidity as long as it's non-condensing. Um, so, yeah. Okay, excellent. Got another question that just came in here. So I have a couple answers for it. Uh, FX Strike Tactical can interface with the Alpha FX. Is it capable of pulling content directly from Alpha? Also, what is the video feed quality from Alpha, as well as compression and bandwidth specs for that pull? Yep. Um, so I guess the short answer to that question is yes. Um, the more technical answer, I guess I would look to Jared. Uh, yeah, so you can encode the wall from uh, the alpha effects that you might have at your uh, dock location. Um, there's a lot of different quality settings that you can play around with um, for that. So uh, it is variable. Uh, we do use H.264 um, encoding uh, for that. So uh, it's kind of a general, uh, uh, I guess, spec around the resolution and frame rate uh, and what kind of quality that you're looking for. So uh, you might have a... a Stream that you know if you're just trying to send a, a 1080, um, I guess, uh, composite of what exactly is going on in your wall. You know, it might be a megabit uh, or less. Uh, but if you wanted to send a full resolution, you know, 4K60, and you know, have all the detail, you might uh, be around 15 uh, megabits per second. So uh, there's a lot of levers that we can pull on both resolution, frame rate, uh, and quality to kind of fit those needs. All right, excellent. Up next, how many output connections can a strike work with in the field? Um, so output-wise, uh, out of the box, the strike can work with four connections. So you could do four 4K or four HD or some combination thereof. Um, 
and then if there was a specific need or application, um, theoretically, you could drive up to uh, 16 displays HD, but that would require a little bit of a, a additional hardware and engineering. That would be a, a very specific use. All right. Great. Thank you for that. And we've got one more question left. Again, if anyone wants to, wants to go ahead and submit something, please feel free to submit that in the chat in the lower right-hand corner. But uh, our next question up is going to be, how quickly can a single person set up a strike? Uh, yep. So I personally, um, with very limited technical training, have been able to set up the strike in about 10 minutes. I would say on average, um, most people could set it up in under 15 minutes. All right. Great. I'll give it just a moment here to see if we have any other questions coming in right now. Don't look like we have anything getting typed out, so I believe that might do it. All right, everyone. Thank you again for joining us today. We appreciate you guys taking the time to be with us. You'll be receiving an email with a link to this recorded presentation shortly, and we hope to see you, and have a great day.